coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition. A watchdog group that is supposed to fight for consumers is now on the defensive amid allegations of embezzlement and kickbacks. And a closer look at the San Diego study linking sleeping pills to cancer. Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Peggy Pico in for Dwayne Brown. The San Diego Consumer Watchdog Group is dissolving. The Utility Consumers Action Network is best known for taking on utilities like San Diego Gas and Electric on behalf of ratepayers. But now UCAN is dealing with legal troubles of its own. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharman has the details from the News Center. Amitha, what are the legal problems UCAN is facing right now? Well, Peggy, UCAN is facing allegations of financial impropriety and a federal grand jury probe. Whistleblowers who work for UCAN say they noticed suspicious financial transactions. They say they brought the information to UCAN's board members, but were told it was groundless. Why is UCAN choosing to dissolve itself? In its press advisory, UCAN said it wanted to protect its assets while resolving this, these issues. And will they still be active in opposing SDG&E's latest request for a rate increase? UCAN's executive director, Michael Shames, says the organization will remain an advocate for consumers. KPBS investigative reporter, Amitha Sharma, thanks very much. We now go to the roundtable where Joanne has more on this breaking story. We should tell you, you can confirmed on its website it is under federal investigation and received a federal grand jury subpoena on February 22nd. The two UCAN employees who complained of wrongdoing are Charles Langley, an analyst with UCAN, and David Pepper, an, an, an attorney with the Watchdog Agency. They join me in studio now. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Now, I want to let people at home know we're not going to get into the details of your allegations against uh, UCAN employees, and this involves higher senior management employees at UCAN because, of course, these are allegations. Uh, there has been no indictment at this point, but Charles, I want to begin with you and ask you, when you first went to the board to uh, report what you felt was uh, financial impropriety? I did it in, uh, I think, around April 6th. I. I sent some pretty extensive documents just documenting uh, various uh, what what I felt was inappropriate uh, activity at UCAN. It was a confidential internal complaint. And uh, now David you had sent a letter to the board as well around that time or a little bit before that. Yes I sent a letter on March 4th uh, 2010. And I know we've been calling you whistleblowers but this began as confidential complaints to the board. Right. Uh, you know, when you think of a whistleblower, you think of someone going public and blowing the whistle. We, we haven't done that. Essentially, you can blew the whistle on itself by, by posting an anonymous, oddly enough, press advisory last night. The advisory keeps changing. Um, our status as employees keeps changing, depending on when you check the advisory. And uh, we, we didn't go to the media. We didn't take this outside of the family. And we didn't ask for this. And we don't want UCAN to dissolve. We don't think it's appropriate for UCAN to dissolve at this time. So let's back up a little bit. You, you had concerns. You went to your board. You wrote them formal letters. Um, what did the board say to you? How did they respond? It took them a while to respond. Um, it took a couple of weeks. And when they did, it was very hopeful for us. They had retained what they said was a really well-known um, nonprofit attorney, and they said they were going to conduct a full forensic audit. That never happened. The audit never happened. And so then what happened? You, you went to a lawyer. Well, we, we waited. We waited patiently for some type of result uh, from this, this investigation. We're still waiting for the results of what is essentially a secret investigation. And what's disturbing about this is UCAN is, is member funded. It's a 501c3 nonprofit that enjoys huge tax advantages. And in a sense, every US and California taxpayer owns a piece of UCAN. And they appear to have spent more than $100,000 
conducting a secret investigation and then saying, well, everything's fine, everything's okay. Some of this is public money too, isn't it? Isn't there some PUC, Public Utilities uh, Commission money that gets funneled back into UCAN as well? Yeah, it's something called intervener compensation. When UCAN uh, prevails uh, in a rate decision with SDG&E or is deemed to have contributed some value to a rate hearing, a portion of our legal expenses are, are re reimbursed. It's called intervener income, and uh, it's a significant portion of UCAN's revenue. And that makes it public money. Now, David, I want to ask you, you're, you're, you're a lawyer, yes, I but am. you went to a lawyer when the board didn't hear your complaints. Is this to now sue the board, or was it, what is it that you asked your lawyer to do? I asked my lawyer to represent us in trying to push through the investigation and the reforms that we've been asking for. What we want is a clean, honest, transparent watchdog, one that lives up to the ideals that so many people here believe UCAN stands for. Have you both been fired? It depends on what version of the uh, press advisory on the website you read. It, it has referred to former employees and then current staff, and it seems to change every couple of hours. Now, both of you were on this show last week. Mm -hmm. David, you were here to talk about SDG&E proposed rate hikes, mm -hmm. and Charles, you were here to talk about gas, gas prices. Mm -hmm. Now, one week later, this you, you were speaking on behalf of an agency that's supposed to represent the consumer. You're a watchdog mm -hmm. agency, and now mm -hmm. look, look what's happened now, one week later. How do you feel knowing that now you are representing a, 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 really an agency that, that obviously you have a lot of concerns about? This is devastating. It's something that's been going on in the background for quite a while, but we were always hopeful that we could change things, that we could make this agency something great. Um, and with the dissolution, that, that's, it's heartbreaking. I feel really distressed. We're asking really simple questions. How much money was there? Where did it go? How was it spent? In what accounts? And why? Are we suddenly out of money now? I attended a, a board meeting on December 15, 2011, or ex no, 2010, where Michael Shames announced that UCAN was financially healthy and viable. They were talking about buying a new building, that they had enough money to literally go for two years without a penny of fundraising. And fundraising is actually an important aspect of my job there. So it's very disturbing. It went suddenly on the same day a grand jury subpoena is issued, the organization decides to dissolve rather than open up its books and say, honestly, this is what's happening. This is where the money went. Charles Langley, David Peffer, thank you for being here. KBBS reached out to UCAN board members, but they declined our request for an interview. UCAN CEO Michael Shames also declined to be interviewed, but did issue this statement. I'm not going anywhere, and SDG&E will need to put away that high-priced champagne for at least another five years or so before they begin popping any corks. And, of course, he's referring to UCAN's action against SDG&E. Also, on UCAN's website, a press advisory with the following comment. No evidence confirming such allegations was provided by those lodging allegations, nor discovered by any of the professionals retained by UCAN's board. And, of course, that was posted by Anonymous, and that is on UCAN's website. Today, a judge denied a union request to stop a vote on raising hotel room taxes in San Diego. Hotel owners will vote in a few weeks on raising taxes to pay for an expansion of the San Diego Convention Center. A union representative for hotel workers claims the plan is illegal. They want all city residents to vote on the tax, not just hotel owners. The city plans to take the issue to court if the tax is approved. The judge says the union can make its argument at that time. California Attorneys General Kamala Harris has announced the introduction of a homeowner's bill of rights in the legislature. The package of six bills is intended to reform the mortgage process and provide more protection for homeowners. The package includes terms from a nationwide settlement with the biggest mortgage lenders in the country, which include things like the end to robo-signing and more transparency in the foreclosure process. Also today, Harris says her office will not oppose a class action settlement 
settlement with Honda over its hybrid cars. Honda agreed to pay buyers a few hundred dollars each to settle complaints over an overinflated fuel efficiency claims. But California and several other states decided to take a second look at the matter after a Los Angeles woman won nearly $10,000 in small claims in a small claim suit for the same complaint. The Attorney General's office is not explaining why they are not trying for more money. If you take prescription pills to get a good night's sleep, our next interview may keep you up at night. We'll talk in depth with a Scripps researcher about his new study we first told you about that links sleeping pills to increased risk of cancer and death. And from our Fronteras desk, a look at what's left behind after the real estate boom and bust south of the border. Plus, how bad news for developers may be good news for environmentalists. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Gwen Ipel. On the next News Hour, the GOP presidential candidates turn to Super Tuesday when voters in 10 states select over 400 convention delegates. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. The fabric of democracy, I think, really has worn very thin. The opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Americans have to fight for the American dream. Democracy is not what governments do, it's, it's what people do. This is how we fight back. Moyers and Company. I'm Bill Moyers. Join me Friday nights at 10 on KPBS San Diego. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Taking sleeping pills on a regular basis is associated with an increased risk of death and cancer. That's according to a study published in the online journal BMJ Open. It's authored by local researcher Dr. Daniel Kripke. Some of the findings are alarming. Let's take a look. Patients using hypnotics, or in other words, sleeping pills, had an increased risk of death. Fewer than 18 hypnotic doses per year increased mortality. Overall, cancer increased by 35% among those prescribed high doses. Now, joining me to talk about these findings is Scripps researcher, Dr. Daniel Kripke. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So tell us about how you went about this research. And this study was done with the help of electronic medical records uh, of a big system in northeastern U.S. And uh, we found in a five-year period over 10,000 patients who had been prescribed sleeping pills. And then we matched them with over 20,000 controls who had never been prescribed a sleeping pill. And we matched them for age and for their sex and for whether or not they smoked. And then statistically, we matched them for health for 12 different kinds of diagnoses. So it's what we call a matched cohort study. So for people who might say, okay, well, the people who were taking sleeping pills, maybe they just were in poor health to begin with, which is why they were taking sleeping pills. Your study accounted for that. It's true that the people taking sleeping pills were in somewhat poorer health than those uh, not getting those prescriptions, but not four times worse. And we did control for that statistically to the extent we were able. And let me say the control made very little difference. So even though the control is imperfect, if the amount of control we did made so little difference, I think 
more control wouldn't make much difference. Now, the drugs you looked at are, are I, I want to say, fairly common. I mean, we, we know these names, Ambien, Lunesta, even Benadryl. Benadryl, an antihistamine was on this list. So what, what is it about these drugs? Is there a common thing that is sort of increasing your risk? Well, we studied these because they were the ones commonly used in this health system. And uh, I didn't ex necessarily expect Benadryl or Ambien to show a risk. And certainly I was surprised by what we found. Yes, I was shocked. I'm still shocked at the size of this risk. Now, I want to split this up into two categories because it's also increased risk of death. Now, did you, did, was your stu study able to determine the cause of death? Just, I mean, months past, KPBS reported that one of the leading causes of accidental death is due to prescription drug overdose. Uh, we've had some high-profile cases in the media lately about this. How do we know that people aren't dying because they're taking sleeping pills and they're drinking and they're taking something else? Well, we know they are. That's one of the causes. And we know that uh, they tend to find a lot of sleeping pills in the blood of people who've had automobile accidents, people who have falls, uh, people who die at night. So uh, these are probably some of the causes. So it's not necessarily what's in the sleeping pill causing you to die, it's the fact that it puts you in a certain state of mind. The sleeping pills, they stop our brain cells from working, and that's not good for you. Uh, in the highest doses, barbiturates are used to execute prisoners because they stop breathing. In lower doses, when mixed with alcohol and other things, uh, all of these drugs can stop breathing or make sleep apnea worse. And that's probably one of the mechanisms, not the only one. Uh, they cause depression, and people taking sleeping pills have a high suicide rate. They cause infections and they cause cancer. We don't have a lot of time left. This is work you've been doing for a very long time. Uh, you told me earlier back in the 70s is when you first discovered that sleeping pills were probably not very good for you. You know, is this, some people might argue that maybe this has been a long time sort of mission to sort of find, you know, for you to kind of come to this conclusion. Well, we saw evidence earlier. This is the strongest evidence and this is the first evidence to name the particular pills. But there are 18 different studies done mainly by other people in other countries that show the same association of sleeping pills with mortality. It's not just my study. Uh, the only thing about this study that's special is it names the pills, it shows the dose response, and it was better controlled for confusing factors than the other studies. And I want to tell the people at home that we have the list of those drugs. Um, more on this study, uh, more information on our website, kpbs.org. Dr. Daniel Kripke, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The wild and wildlife-rich peninsula of Baja, California, has long lured fishermen, surfers, and nature lovers to its pristine coast. But when real estate boomed in the U.S., it also boomed south of the border, with beachfront high-rises and luxury resorts. Now, the funds behind many coastal developments have dried up, leaving some environmentalists with a sigh of relief. From our Fronteras desk, Joe Replogli reports. Santa Rosalita is a tiny fishing village on the Pacific coast, about 400 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border. There's not much going on here as night falls on a recent weekday evening, just a few dirt bikers roaring around and surfers catching the day's final waves. But only five years ago, this town was bustling with construction. I'm standing in the middle of what was supposed to be the start of a huge development project in Baja, California. It was going to be a marina filled with boats, and it was going to be the first step in the nautical staircase, which was a string of marinas that the federal government had planned for along the coast of Baja, California and the Sea of Cortez. And as you can see, it's completely filled with sand and abandoned. The failed nautical staircase project has become the poster child for overambitious development dreams in Baja, California. It was planned with the expectation that the real estate was, was going to continue growing. 
So we'd say, well, let's put some marinas in key places because we are developing the entire coast. So eventually we'll have thousands of people with yachts coming to Baja California. During its recent boom years, many Mexican developers and Americans in search of a plot of paradise invested in Baja California's miles and miles of unspoiled, breathtaking coastline. Now many are saddled with half-finished condos and acres of remote land with no electricity or water. But some people aren't all that upset about the development freeze. Definitely, obviously, the downturn in the economy has had have been a positive boon for the Baja uh, natural resources. When the Baja boom was happening, literally it seemed like conservationists were fighting all kinds of projects from a plethora of liquefied natural gas terminal proposals, uh, from marina development projects, from high-rise development projects and mega resorts. A lot of that has come to a halt. And thanks to the slowdown, Wild Coast and other conservation groups have been able to buy up discounted coastal land from speculators who once hoped to make a fortune selling beachfront real estate. They're establishing conservation easements on private land, and they're working with the Mexican government to form new protected areas. So in places like San Ignacio Lagoon, Magdalena Bay, the corridor between Loreto and La Paz, and in the Central Pacific Coast, we've been able to really proactively preserve a lot of world-class uh, coastal biodiversity areas. There are areas where gray whales go and where you see whale sharks, um, real world-class, you know, uh, Africa-style wildlife destinations. So that's really exciting. About four hours north of Santa Rosalita is San Quintin Bay. It's an internationally recognized wetlands area. Tens of thousands of migratory water birds winter here. And clams and oysters are abundant. It's uh, one of the last wetlands in North America with, um, I would say, it's 80, 90 percent of the habitat is still in, in good shape. The local government hoped this fragile bay would also house a marina and become a step on the nautical staircase. A mega resort and golf course were also on the drawing board. But now the Mexican conservation group Terra Peninsular is coordinating with the government to establish a federal biosphere reserve on nearly 300,000 acres here. It's also working with local farmers to establish land use plans and sustainable agricultural practices. <laughs> of course, development brought much needed money into this region. And with that money gone, conservationists are hurting too. I mean, nonprofits too depend on, on donations and depends on, on grants to be able to, to do their work. When the development pressures go down, the money for conservation also goes down. Back in Santa Rosalita, locals say the jobs and income promised by the marina could have been good for the town. Even though it's not likely to ever be operational, the marina project did bring electricity and a paved road. Oh, and a few surfing tourists. The marina break wall created a nice new wave. Now, local fishermen are brainstorming ideas for what to do with this sandy corral. Algo de, de cultivos. Sería algo muy especial que se pudiera... Some kind of farm. It would be really special if we could do that kind of work there. For example, an abalone or fish farm. Why not? It's really interesting, and I think we have a very interesting place to do it. Transform a failed marina into a fish farm? Why not? Baja's isolated residents are used to making something out of what appears to be a waste. That was Jill Replogle reporting. To date, San Diego-based Wild Coast has preserved nearly 23,000 acres of land along Baja California's central Pacific coast through direct purchases and conservation easements. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Hello, I'm Peter Marshall. And I'm Nick Clooney with another edition of my music from the glorious Big Band era. Night and day. Music is it's timeless. It's my music. The Big Band vocalist right here on PBS. Saturday at 6 on KPBS. I love KPBS because when I wake up in the morning and that radio station goes on, 89.5 goes on, I know that I am going to get information that I can trust, that I can respect, that I can value, and I know I'm getting the truth.
He brought you Faces of America, African American Lives, Oprah's Roots, and now in his new series. That's pretty remarkable. Henry Louis Gates Jr. shares extraordinary revelations. Oh my God. About the lives of these talented Americans. The new series, Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr., coming in March, only on PBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, feedback from my interviews last night. I spoke with Lonnie Lutar, head of the San Diego County Taxpayers Association, about pension costs. I refer to the association as a watchdog agency. And Chris Brewster made this point. He writes, while I appreciate you featuring a report by the San Diego Taxpayers Association, keep in mind that this is primarily a business group, not a grassroots taxpayer organization. Chris points out the association's 33-member board is comprised mostly of businesses, not individuals. And on our roundtable discussion about changes to how Californians will cast their ballots in June's primary, Richard Winger, who publishes BallotAccess.org, said I got it wrong when I called the new system an open primary. He writes, open primary has been defined in political science textbooks since 1907 and in U.S. Supreme Court decisions starting in 1970. As a system in which each party has its own primary ballot and its own nominees. But on primary day, any voter is free to choose any party's primary ballot. So California's new system is called a, two, a top two primary. That means voters get one ballot for most partisan races, listing all candidates representing both parties. So thank you, Richard, for setting us straight. Again, open primary, you would pick the ballot you want, whereas top two, you get one ballot all the names on it. Well, you can weigh in on this conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can just email me directly, jferian at kpbs.org. And now let's go back to the news desk where Peggy has a recap of tonight's top stories. A consumer watchdog agency is dissolving in the midst of legal problems. The Utility Consumers Action Network faces a grand jury investigation and claims of financial impropriety. UCAN says it's dissolving to protect its assets while it resolves these issues. And a judge has rejected a union request to stop hotel owners from voting on a proposed room tax to pay for expanding the San Diego Convention Center. The Hotel Workers Union wants all San Diegans to vote on the tax, not just hotel owners. The judge says since the city is planning to take the matter to court, if the tax passes, the union can have its say then. And state lawmakers have introduced a homeowner's bill of rights. California Attorney General Kamala Harris says it's a package of bills designed to reform the mortgage process and to protect homeowners. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, and we'll leave you with a look at the forecast. <music>